NASA and modern astronomy maintain that the moon is a solid, spherical, Earth-like habitation which man has actually flown to and set foot on. They claim the moon is a non-luminescent planetoid which receives and reflects all its light from the sun. The reality is, however, that the moon is not a solid body. It is clearly circular, but not spherical, and not in any way an Earth-like planetoid which humans could set foot on. In fact, the moon is largely transparent and completely self-luminescent, shining with its own unique light. The sun's light is golden, warm, drying, preservative, and antiseptic, while the moon's light is silver, cool, damp, putrefying, and septic. The sun's rays decrease the combustion of a bonfire, while the moon's rays increase combustion. Plant and animal substances exposed to sunlight quickly dry, shrink, coagulate, and lose the tendency to decompose and putrefy. Grapes and other fruits become solid, partially candied and preserved, like raisins, dates, and prunes. Animal flesh coagulates, loses its volatile gaseous constituents, becomes firm, dry, and slow to decay. When exposed to moonlight, however, plant and animal substances tend to show symptoms of putrefaction and decay. In direct sunlight, a thermometer will read higher than another thermometer placed in the shade, but in full, direct moonlight, a thermometer will read lower than another placed in the shade. If the sun's light is collected in a large lens and thrown to a focus point, it can create significant heat, while the moon's light, collected similarly, creates no heat. In the Lancet Medical Journal from March 14, 1856, particulars are given of several experiments which proved the moon's rays, when concentrated, can actually reduce the temperature upon a thermometer more than 8 degrees. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, The sun's light, when concentrated by a number of plane or concave mirrors, throwing the light to the same point, or by a large burning lens, produces a black or non-luminous focus in which the heat is so intense that metallic and alkaline substances are quickly fused, earthy and mineral compounds almost immediately vitrified, and all animal and vegetable structures in a few seconds decomposed, burned up, and destroyed. The moon's light, concentrated in the above manner, produces a focus so brilliant and luminous that it is difficult to look upon it, yet there is no increase of temperature. In the focus of sunlight, there is great heat, but no light. In that of the moon's light, there is great light, but no heat. David Wardlaw Scott wrote, Light which is reflected must necessarily be of the same character as that which causes the reflection. But the light of the moon is altogether different from the light of the sun. Therefore, the light of the moon is not reflected from the sun. The sun's light is red and hot, the moon's pale and cold. The sun's dries and preserves certain kinds of fish and fruit, such as cod and grapes, for the table, but the moon's turns such to putrefaction. The sun's will often put out a coal fire, while the moon's will cause it to burn more brightly. The rays of the sun focused through a burning glass will set wood on fire, and even fuse metals, while the rays of the moon, concentrated to the strongest power, do not exhibit the very slightest signs of heat. I have myself long thought that the light of the moon is electric, but, be that as it may, even a board school child can perceive that its light is totally unlike that of the sun. So sunlight and moonlight clearly have altogether different properties, and furthermore, the moon itself cannot physically be both a spherical body and a reflector of the sun's light. Reflectors must be flat or concave for the light rays to have any angle of incidence. If a reflector's surface is convex, then every ray of light points in a direct line with the radius perpendicular to the surface, resulting in no reflection. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, Again, if the moon is a sphere, which it is declared to be, how can its surface reflect the light of the sun? If her surface was a mass of polished silver, it could not reflect from more than a mere point. Let a silvered glass ball or globe of considerable size be held before a lamp 
or fire of any magnitude, and it will be seen that instead of the whole surface reflecting light, there will be a very small portion only illuminated. But the moon's whole surface is brilliantly illuminated, a condition or effect utterly impossible if it be spherical. The Bible also attests that the moon is self-luminescent and not a mere reflector of sunlight in Genesis 1.16, where it states that God made two great luminaries, the greater luminary to rule the day and the lesser luminary to rule the night. Not only is the moon clearly self-luminescent, shining its own unique light, but it is also largely transparent. NASA photoshoppers claim the moon is a dark, spherical planetoid, yet with our own eyes, or through a telescope, we can see it is actually a bright, circular, semi-transparent luminary. On a clear night, during a waxing or waning cycle, it is even possible to occasionally see stars and planets directly through the surface of the moon. On March 7, 1794, four astronomers, three in Norwich, one in London, wrote in The Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Astronomical Society that they, quote, saw a star in the dark part of the moon, which had not then attained the first quadrature, and from the representations which are given, the star must have appeared very far advanced upon the disk. Sir James South of the Royal Observatory in Kensington wrote a letter to the Times newspaper April 7, 1848, that, quote, on the 15th of March, 1848, when the moon was seven and a half days old, I never saw her unillumined disk so beautifully. On my first looking into the telescope, a star of about the seventh magnitude was some minutes of a degree distant from the moon's dark limb. I saw that its occultation by the moon was inevitable. The star, instead of disappearing the moment the moon's edge came into contact with it, apparently glided on the moon's dark face, as if it had been seen through a transparent moon, or as if a star were between me and the moon. I have seen a similar apparent projection several times. The cause of this phenomenon is involved in impenetrable mystery. In the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, for June 8, 1860, Thomas Gaunt stated that the, quote, occultation of Jupiter by the moon on the 24th of May, 1860, was seen with an achromatic of 3.3 inches aperture, 50 inches focus, the immersion with a power of 50, and the immersion with a power of 70. At the immersion, I could not see the dark limb of the moon until the planet appeared to touch it, and then only to the extent of the diameter of the planet but what I was most struck with was the appearance on the moon as it passed over the planet. It appeared as though the planet was a dark object and glided onto the moon instead of behind it. And the appearance continued until the planet was hid, when I suddenly lost the dark limb of the moon altogether. I have personally also seen stars through the edge of the waxing and waning moon. It actually happens fairly often. If you are diligent and specifically observing for the phenomenon on starry nights, you can occasionally see it even with the naked eye. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, During a partial solar eclipse, the sun's outline has many times been seen through the body of the moon. But those who have been taught to believe that the moon is a solid, opaque sphere are ever ready with explanations, often of the most inconsistent character, rather than acknowledge the simple fact of semi-transparency. Not only has this been proved by the visibility of the sun's outline through segments, and sometimes the very center of the moon, but often, at new moon, the outline of the whole, and even the several shades of light on the opposite and illuminated part, have been distinctly seen. In other words, we are often able to see through the dark side of the moon's body to light on the other side. J. Atkinson wrote in Earth Review magazine that the moon is not a perfectly opaque body, but a crystallized substance is shown from the fact that when a few hours old, or even at quarter, we can through the unilluminated portion see the light shining on the other side. Stars have also been observed through her surface. A star occulting a crescent moon has long been a popular symbol of Islam, was the symbol of the Ottoman Empire. It is found on the flags of Algeria, Azerbaijan, Libya, Malaysia, Mauritania, Pakistan, Singapore, Tunisia, Turkey, 
and in the coat of arms of countries from Croatia to Germany, Ireland, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Sweden, Ukraine, and the United Kingdom. Its origins can be traced back thousands of years to ancient Hindu culture, where it is found in the symbol for the word Om, the primary name for the Almighty, representing the union of God Shiva and Goddess Shakti. Why the symbol has carried such widespread historical significance is open to interpretation, but regardless of interpretation, the image of stars occulting the moon has long been a prevalent and meaningful picture. That stars and planets have been seen through the moon is a fact, but to this day NASA, modern astronomy, and a world full of brainwashed heliocentrists maintain that the moon is a spherical, earth-like habitation capable of landing spaceships on. They claim the moon, and Mars for that matter, are habitable desert planets, much like Star Wars Tatooine, Dunes Arrakis, and other such imaginary science fiction worlds. Since long before the staged Apollo moon landings, these Masonic sun-worshipping heliocentrists have been claiming the moon to be a solid planetoid, complete with plains, plateaus, mountains, valleys, and craters, though nothing of the sort can be discerned, even using the best telescopes. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, Astronomers have indulged in imagination to such a degree that the moon is now considered to be a solid, opaque, spherical world, having mountains, valleys, lakes or seas, volcanic craters, and other conditions analogous to the surface of the earth. So far has this fancy been carried that the whole visible disk has been mapped out and special names given to its various peculiarities, as though they had been carefully observed and actually measured by a party of terrestrial ordnance surveyors. All this has been done in direct opposition to the fact that whoever, for the first time, and without previous bias of mind, looks at the moon's surface through a powerful telescope, is puzzled to say what it is really like, or how to compare it with anything known to him. The comparison which may be made will depend upon the state of mind of the observer. It is well known that persons looking at the rough bark of a tree, or at the irregular lines or veins in certain kinds of marble and stone, or gazing at the red embers in a dull fire, will, according to the degree of activity of the imagination, be able to see many different forms, even the outlines of animals and of human faces. It is in this way that persons may fancy that the moon's surface is broken up into hills and valleys, and other conditions, such as are found on earth, but that anything really similar to the surface of our own world is anywhere visible upon the moon is altogether fallacious.